want to welcome Lorraine Pendleton today as our guest speaker, who will be sharing many of her wisdom, insights, and successes in investment and other careers. So thank you very much for joining us. We want to do the standing up so that you can all see us. If we sit, you can't. I'm going to be asking Lorraine a series of questions, and then we'll open it up to Q&A with all of you. And a shout out to my leadership class for coming in. Uh, I think this will be a great topic for you to explore. So Lorraine, you have had many successes in your career. Can you take us through your background and journey? Sure. So I'll start off brown here. So I just want to say thank you for coming out. And it's really great to be uh, back here on campus. It's brought back a lot of memories. So um, graduated in 91. And, uh, I'll back up a little bit. So while I was at Brown, I was actually a radio DJ on WBRU. And, <laughs> um, and so in that experience, um, I decided to get into the entertainment industry. So I actually majored in economics. I minored in computer science. And um, I had an internship in between um, the breaks, like the, the winter break with an alumni who worked at uh, Blue Note Records, which was Capital Records Jazz Label. And they made me an offer when I graduated. So that was my first job. Um, didn't make a lot of money, so I was living with my parents um, in New Jersey. But it was a really great experience. Um, got into the entertainment industry. Um, yeah, started out at the very bottom. Um, and then I knew I wanted to go to graduate school, either business school or law school. So I asked the president of the label, Bruce Lundvall, um, I said, you know, hey, I want to go. I'm thinking about law school or business school. What, what do you think? What should, what, what should I go to? And I was going to go evening because I want to keep my contacts in the entertainment industry. And he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to have a career in entertainment. And he said, well, go to law school. It's the best business degree you can get. And so I thought that was really a great advice. And I ended up going to law school evening division. I went to New York Law. And that was a four-year program. So I did that for four years. And actually, um, in between that, while I was going to law school, I ended up um, going joining the William Morris Agency, which is now uh, Endeavor, William Morris, um, or maybe just Endeavor. Um, it was actually the largest and oldest talent agency. So think about, you know, we had, um, you know, like Tom Cruise, big, big you know, movie stars. We had writers. We had music artists. And we were their agents. So we would book them, and we would get 10% of whatever we did. So I worked in the legal, uh, the legal affairs department, business affairs as a paralegal, and that was just a really great experience. And again, you know, going to law school. So when I graduated four years later, I ended up joining a very small entertainment boutique firm, Lana McMillan uh, PC. So it was one uh, partner, it was his own firm he started, African American um, gentleman, and he was um, you know, pretty young when I joined him. He was in his 30s. But his claim to fame was he got Prince out of his agreement with Warner Brothers, um, and Prince was his client. And so um, we had this small firm. I was one of five associates, and then Londell. Uh, we have big artists, and I'm dating myself, but you know, uh, Dia Max, um, Eve, um, actually Swiss Beats was a client before he became really big. He was 18 years old, and we were working with him. Um, so you know, Shaka Khan, Stevie Wonder, all these really great artists, and it was really incredible. Um, and this is around the time when the internet was just starting. And I knew that there was going to be a convergence of technology with entertainment. And I just could see like what was happening. MP3.com had just come out. And so I had met this startup company that had this great technology that they were licensing to entertainment companies. And they asked me to join them because my entertainment contacts, they gave me equity in the company. And it was a great run. Uh, it was my first lesson before I became an invest investor about product market fit. So they had a great product, but there was not a big enough market yet for it. They were ahead of their time. So we had gotten money from GE Ventures, and I was trying to do deals. Um, we just ran out of money. We couldn't, you know, we didn't have enough customers and clients. So we had to wind down the co co company. So I was at a crossroads. Do I continue on this path of, you know, this technology internet space, or do I go back to being a lawyer, entertainment? And I decided to, to stay on this path of the internet. So I joined another company called Community Connect. Um, and they were really interesting. Um, it was basically social media. They were one of the first social media companies. So before Facebook existed, probably Mark Zuckerberg was probably like a kid uh, when they came out. And um, it was basically like Facebook. So you can have your friends, you have your, you know, your profile, but it was geared to the ethnic market. So they had Black Planet, Asian Avenue, and Mahente. And these were actually 20 million users. So we were basically bringing together um, the ethnic market online and then I was responsible for selling ads and business development executive, you know, getting companies to reach those markets on, online. And so we had to convince them back then, which is silly to me now because everyone uses the internet, but that 
you know, black people or, you know, Latino people are on, you know, are on the internet. And so, believe it or not, we had to convince them that and then also that our members would come and use our sites and it was just very sticky. So that company was sold. Um, I joined another company called Select Minds, which is actually um, one of the founders, Ann Berkowitz is a Brown alumni actually. Um, and I joined that company. They were basically a B2B business to business software as a service um, company where they were creating social network pr programs for companies. So for instance, um, Accenture was a client, um, EY was a client. Um, they were developing alumni programs, so online alumni programs, outsource, so you keep in touch with your alumni, because a lot of them end up being buyers of, of services. And so, um, you know, it was a good way for, like an EY, someone moves on and they become a CEO or a C-suite, you know, keeping in touch, a network, much like going to Brown, keeping in touch with your, you know, alumni. And so, that company was sold to Oracle. Um, so that was a really great result. And then, again, at kind of at a crossroads. So I went back to the legal world, but on the business development side, um, working at big, big global law firms. I worked at Simpson Thatcher, um, Morgan Lewis, and most recently Denton's. Uh, but working with firm leadership to bring in clients um, and you know, doing strategy for the firm. We would enter new markets, acquire firms. So that was a really great experience. But about six years ago, um, while I was doing that, you know, I was kind of restless a little bit about, um, you know, missing startup world, not necessarily want to go back to it, but kind of the pivotal moment to where I, I got here now. I was watching a show on CNN, um, Soledad O'Brien, and it was um, Black in America. She did a program, and she focused on these entrepreneurs, 10 of them, who were uh, in an accelerator program out in Silicon Valley. And she had said during that program, which really stuck with me, less than 1% would ever get funding for their idea. And so I had worked at three startups, all of which were funded. One wasn't successful, but still was funded. Two were funded, successful, and they had exits. And I knew what it took. You know, if you're not properly funded, it's really difficult. Um, and so that just really you know, um, stayed with me. And I just thought, hey, you know what? I want to change that. So I said, I want to start investing. So great. You know, I had a legal background, like business development, marketing background, but did not have a financial background. And so I say the universe conspires, because literally about three weeks later, um, there was a newsletter that I would get uh, called Daily Worth, focus on finance for women. And in that newsletter, they featured the founder of this uh, organization called Pipeline Angels. And her whole mission was to teach women to become angel investors to help increase the number of women getting angel investments. So I applied, and I got in. And that was I graduated literally six years ago. Um, it was an amazing program. I was actually the second class to graduate. Um, now there's over 400 women who have gone through that program collectively. In that program have invested in 50 companies, over $5 million. Um, and she literally is helping change the face of angel investing. And that started my angel investing career. I invested in my first company um, with my peers. It was a cohort of 11 of us. Um, and to this day, I'm friends with most of them. Uh, we just became really close. And all of them are doing some pretty amazing things. And then I started investing in a number of other companies. I've invested in four companies directly. and then. Um, one of the members of that cohort, Barbara Clark, who I became friends with um, in Pipeline, uh, she told me about Portfolia, and she was leading a fund, and it's basically, um, it's, it's basically um, pooling together angel investors and creating funds and then investing in different verticals or companies. The cool thing about it is uh, it's, it's women. Uh, most of the investors are women. And the founder, Trish Costello, had ran the Kauffman Fellows Program, which is part of the Kauffman Foundation which is a big think tank, a foundation focused on entrepreneurship. But they have a program where they work with, train you to be a VC. And a lot of top VCs in this country have um, gone out of, come out of that program. And so what she was seeing after running that for 20 years, about a third every year were women. They would go on and you know, do deals with great angel, uh, VCs. But they were hitting a glass ceiling um, and not becoming a partner. And uh, she wanted to uh, change that. And so pooling together women as angel investors and then creating funds um, where general partners can invest. And actually, I'm going to be leading the eighth fund for Portfolio, the Rising America Fund, which we just literally launched yesterday. Um, and you know, we're going to uh, try to raise a $10 million fund. So thank you. That's actually an excellent point to uh, launch our second question, which is, what challenges do you still see in the VC and investment community when it comes to funding and supporting women and minority-led ventures? So unfortunately, I told you, I said, you know, less than 1%. Um, like six years ago, I said less than 
of entrepreneurs, particularly black entrepreneurs, get funding. Unfortunately, that number hasn't really changed. Um, so that's a challenge. So also, women getting funding is a challenge. So uh, PitchBook, uh, which tracks funding and um, you know funding, um, they put out a report last year. A uh, hundred billion dollars was invested in various startups in the United States. Of that, only two percent went to women, and so that's still a, a big challenge. Um, I think there is a little bit of hope now. You know. When I started angel investing, I think it was only about 20,000 women in the United States were angel investors. Now there's over 400,000. So that's a huge change in, in six years. And so with that, you know, you're know, you finding that early stage companies are getting more in investments, whether you're diverse um, or um, you know, a, a woman, in terms of the early stage. Now when you get to VC, it's still an issue. But at least these companies who have an idea, they're able to find angel investors which are big in terms of fueling. People always think of venture capitalists, but you don't get to VC, VC money until you've kind of established, you've got friends and family, your angel investors. So at least at that early, very early stage, which was really crucial for a company, they're getting some funding. So that's, that's a positive, but there's still you know, a challenge on the later stage VC front, absolutely. So in terms of some of the positives that you're seeing, what success stories are you hearing in the industry and by entrepreneurs who have successfully funded their companies? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's, an, I mean, there's a number of success stories. You know, I can kind of go through a couple. Um, one, Marla Blow, FS Card. Um, she was an executive of Capital One. I actually know her. She's based in DC. She launched a company, a credit card, targeting you know, people who were lower income and not being predatory. She really wanted to change it. Um, so most of those, her clients were people of color. She actually was able to raise $30 million and she sold her company this year. She hasn't disclosed how much, but she basically posted, you know, I'm gonna be retired for a couple of years hanging out on the beach, so I'm sure she did well. Um, so that's definitely a great success story. In terms of funding, getting funding, these companies haven't had an exit, um, but Maven Hair is a really interesting company. Um, African American gentleman, he was at Stanford, he actually dropped out to launch his company. It's hair extensions, which actually, um, not only in the ethnic market, but you know, a lot of women use them, particularly celebrities. Um, he saw that, uh, he went direct to the manufacturers of them that are mainly in China and India, and kind of cut out the middle person. And so hair salons were actually losing kind of this captive market because they would send their customers to go buy it at stores. So he said, why don't you create your own little shop, e-commerce shop, um, I'll provide the back end and all of that and you know, get that, Get these hair extensions, and so he bootstrapped that. Um, in in a, like a year or two, made two two million dollars. There was no uh, VCs or anyone that wanted to invest in him, but he bootstrapped it. And then Andreessen Horowitz, which is a large VC firm, actually um, you know made an investment with him about four years ago, ten million, and then recently they invested in him and again about twenty million, and he he has about eighty million in revenue. Um, so he's, he's really successful. And these are, so it's interesting, when he launched it, people are saying, oh, these are such niche market, niche markets. You know, I'm gonna give you a stat. The ethnic market, um, also LGBTQ market, if you look at in terms of uh, annual spend, it's $1.6 trillion. So that's like, a, that's like massive. Um, if you look at it in terms of GDP, that would be like the fifth largest country um, in the world if, from a straight GDP perspective. So these are not niche markets. And people say, oh, the ethnic market is niche. You know, in reality, um, 20, by 2046, minority is going to be the majority in the United States. So these are not niche markets. Thank you. So I'm sure there's many folks in here who are aspiring entrepreneurs. What would you recommend? What are some suggestions you'd make to entrepreneurs who want to start and fund their companies but need to navigate challenges? Right. So, I mean, um, being an entrepreneur, the first thing I would say is, you know, really do an analysis of your company. So what's, what is the problem that you're solving? And I tell people, people, um, you know, customers will buy, is it, well, is your, is your problem, the solution you have, is it a vitamin or is it a painkiller? And what I mean is vitamins are, you know, it's great, people take them, people don't take them, but a painkiller, if you have a headache, you know, you're gonna wanna buy a painkiller and take that painkiller more of a necessity um, or more of an urgency. So is that what you're creating? First of all, is a problem big enough? Is your solution something that people are going to run and, and really want to acquire or buy or use? Um, that's really important. And then looking at how big is the addressable market? You know, um, most companies in the United States are not um, 
VC investable type of companies, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it could be a shop, you know, a floral shop. It could be, you know, those aren't like big scalable companies. Companies that are getting investments from VCs, angel investors are scalable companies that are ultimately going to have an exit, and that's how angels and VCs make money. So look at your company and say, is this a lifestyle business? Again, nothing is wrong with that. The majority of companies, you know, or you know, start, uh, you know, this businesses in the in the uh, country are you know, lifestyle businesses. Um, so really be, you know, honest with yourself. What type of company um, do you have? And then, you know, try to, you know, bootstrap it as much as you can. Friends and family, have them help you. You know, if it's a lifestyle business, look at SBA, Small Business Administration. They give out loans, um, you know. Um, and I would say before you launch your company, like test it. See if this is something that's viable. Um, you know, survey people. Is this something that you want that you think they would buy, um, and I, that's really important before you kind of go down that road. Um, so I think those are kind of the key things. No, this is very helpful, thank sure. you. So I wanted to move on to q and I'm sure there's many, many questions in the room, so I'll start taking them, and then we'll hopefully get some answers. So any questions, comments, thoughts for Maureen? So I'll just go in order, yeah. Hi, uh, it's your talk, um, and you know, I'm curious, like, have you ever, like, tried to, like, fit in or, like, be more, like, male or maybe more, like, or what's the line between trying to fit in, like, being yourself? Like, how do you navigate it in that workplace or, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a, like, kind of bringing your authentic self, you know, um, to environments. I mean, I think I've always tried to bring my authentic self. Obviously, you know, Particularly in law, like I've many times have been the only, um, you know, black woman in a room. A lot of times, the only woman in the room. Um, you know, you just you just kind of navigate it. Um, I think, um, but and then also in finance, it's it's very, you know, it's not it's not that diverse. But the cool thing is, I'm in more of the like I'm investing my own money, and then you know this fund, and so I kind of surround myself around like-minded people and kind of you know navigate that world. But when I was at law firms. You know, it was not, it's not the bastard of diversity at all. Um, but, you know, you kind of, you, you just learn how to, how to deal with it um, in some ways. And, um, you know, I didn't have any, like, horrible situations like that. But, um, you know, just kind of find the inner strength and navigate it. And also I would, you know, find kind of my tribe in the law firm, people who became my friends and, you know, like-minded. And when I was, had challenges, there were people I could talk to and, you know, who I trusted or find, finding mentors and advocates for you. Uh, Sophie. Um, do you ever feel like you have to prove yourself or kind of go above and beyond what your coworkers had to do to show that you were working more than you Yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, no, for sure. I remember growing up, my dad said to me, um, you know, you're black in America. And you know you're gonna have to do, um, you know, do 200x or 200 percent more to get half as much. And so that was instilled in me, you know, unfortunately. Um, and so you know, I mean, absolutely, there were certain circumstances where I felt like I had to do, you know, I was doing X, Y, Z above and beyond, and then you know, not kind of getting the credit that I should that I deserved. Um, and then I think that's kind of what led me to kind of go out and do, doing what I'm doing now. I left my law firm about two, two and a half years ago, you know, doing some other things that are more entrepreneurial and then doing this fund, you know, just kind of controlling my own destiny. Um, but no, I mean, you know, it's, it's a part of life, you know. You can either, you suck it up and you deal with it or, you know, you rise above it. And, you know, I was taught from a very young age, you know, just to, for my parents that you're going to have to be strong and rise above it. And so, um, yeah, but absolutely. Oh, I'm back. So what are some things that men can do to be supportive or people who aren't minorities in the room to be supportive? That's a great question. I think, you know, just maybe be an advocate. If you see something happening, if someone is treating a woman or a person of color a certain way, you know, you need to, you should say something, really. Um, I think people respond, you know, I can raise my hand and say, hey, what you said is racist. But if a non-person of color says it, it's definitely impactful. And so, you know, for, for people who, who, you know, if you, I think really people need to stand up and say something, particularly in this day and age, everything that's going on. 
Um, it's up to, you know, if you see something, to, to say something about it or, you know, not a confrontational, but just, you know, call people out on it, I think. I think it'll resonate. Yeah, Jim. Um, I feel like initial angel, angel investments or loans, how do you find venture capitalists that aren't, like, only rooted in their own pockets but are interested in your growth as, like, one of the EOCs and, like, white male dominated industries? Sorry, I'm sorry. How do you, I find, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yeah, how do you, uh, how do you find venture capitalists who are interested in your growth as a one POC in a male, white male dominated Yeah, I mean, actually, um, there are, surprisingly, there are um, a number of people who are interested in investing in women-led companies, diverse-led companies. Um, you know, there's, there's tons of studies that show that women-led companies actually outperform like teams that are all male-led and, you know, whether it's also Fortune 500 companies as well as startups. And so I think more and more men, particularly white males who are tuned in, they're seeing it as if they're not investing, they're going to be missing out on an opportunity. So in some ways, you know, not only is it like, you know, the right thing to do, they're finding that it's the smart thing to do. And so there are, you know, people, you know, in the New York community that I'm, you know, involved in in terms of VC and Angel who are saying, you know, what, uh, actually we've invested in women-like companies. Those companies are doing well. We need to invest in more. And then telling other people about it, you know, it's slowly changing, not like by any means <laughs> as much as it should. But um, I mean, I think there's people who are really seeing uh, what's going on. In particular, right now, I think um, you know, if you look at WeWork, what happened with WeWork, which is just ridiculous um, in terms of the level of funding that uh, Adam was able to get, and then all these stories that are coming out and. You know, um, he, you know, that company was private for a really long time. The valuations were just crazy. Um, in, re in reality, it's a real estate play. It's not a technology company. It was trying to sell it as a technology company. And so um, I think, I hope, you know, and I hear some rumblings about it, but people are thinking, like, you know, there has to definitely be more, you know, executive development, more oversight of these kind of companies. Um, but, you know, I guess you had Elizabeth Holm, but for one Elizabeth Holmes, there's like hundreds of these examples of men doing this. Uh, but the reality is most women don't get that level of funding. And when they get the funding, they have to be cap they're more capital efficient. Um, and they have to do more with less. And so, you know, hopefully I hope the pendulum will shift because of these WeWorks and, you know, not having a woman on the board when studies have shown having a woman, a woman on a board actually makes those companies more successful. Having diversity, like, you know, employees on the board is really important. And that's just a prime example of, you know, cautionary tale what can go wrong. So, you know, I'm hopeful, you know, optim opt but, you know, uh, hopeful that this will change. Hopefully we'll see. Um, my name is Liz Demers. I'm with JP Morgan. So on Tuesday, I went to the E for All uh, Invest in Entrepreneur Summit at uh, UMass Lowell. And one of the entrepreneurs was saying that how crushing it was when they went to a bank and tried to get funding. Um, how can we be better partners to entrepreneurs? How can I affect that type of change within JP Morgan Chase? Um, that really, I, I find in Boston, We've put a, a big, bigger emphasis on this, but I'm just wondering from your perspective and your experience how we can be better partners. Well, I want to give you guys a shout out because I was actually at an event um, a month ago that was uh, funded by J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, I forget the name of the program, but they're definitely doing outreach. Yeah. And it was all women, uh, black women entrepreneurs. Okay. And I know that there's a big initiative at your bank. Um, women on the Move? Yeah, Women on the Move. So that's great, and I think more banks need to do that. I think, you know, I know, I mean, I know people who have applied for loans and they've been denied. I mean, I think it's twofold. So the entrepreneur needs to have all their ducks in order, and even when they do, they get denied um, in some cases. So, um, but I think, you know, the banks need to kind of look through possibly a different lens and say, you know, these entrepreneurs, they have a challenge. They may not, you know, they may not own their house so that they have that as collateral, because when you get a loan, you have to have collateral. So um, just maybe looking at them differently. And I'm, again, not like every, I mean, I'm obviously you're in the business of making money and reducing, mitigating your risk. But you know, some entrepreneurs may not be your typical, what you consider um, the type of entrepreneurs you want to invest in. So maybe using slightly different criteria. Um, so I mean, I think that needs to happen. But I know, you know JP Morgan Chase is definitely you know, doing things in that space, which is commendable. And I think more banks need to do that. Yeah. 
a question in the back. So I want to bring, oh, my name is Patrice Miles, and I'm the CEO of a startup that we spun out of Brown. Um, I want to return to the board question, mm -hmm. uh, board issue, because I think I'm spending a lot of time sort of looking at boards and so forth. Women have made a little bit of progress on getting on boards, but people of color are not at all. The numbers haven't changed since I think we've ever looked at them. So I'm curious you know, how you get yourself involved in sort of perhaps looking at that issue and helping that issue as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm aware of that, and I know, I know some people who are, you know, actively like black women and other people of color who are, you know, looking at getting on a board, and they've had exits or CEOs. You know, it's a big challenge. I, I, you know, I, it's not a challenge that I've been actively attacking, but I mean, it is, it is definitely um, a challenge in terms of the companies, though. And when we making investment decisions, we look at the board. And if it's all men, we actually say, in some cases, we've gotten a board seat or a board observer seat. But we're like, you need to have a woman. You need to, you need to diversify this board. And we actually, I mean, it's not a contingent upon us investing in those companies, but we call them out on it. And you know, all the companies have done that. Um, you know, brought on a you know board member. We'll say, we'll help you find someone if you're, you know, if it's like, oh, I can't find anyone, which is not. I mean, it's always like pipeline <laughs> issue. I'm like, it's not a pipeline no. issue. You're just not looking. You know, in the wrong, you're looking in the wrong pipe, you know? Yeah. Um, and so that's, I guess, in that way, I'm kind of helping with regards to that. But um, yeah, no, it's definitely an issue. Um, but, you know, there's organizations, I'm forgetting the name of it, um, but looking at putting women on boards, um, you know, and in California, you know, I don't know if you know, they passed a law that um, a company has to have at least one woman on the board. I don't know if it's come into effect yet. So there's a lot of scrambling companies are looking for mm -hmm. women and, um, so that's actually a great business model, actually, because there's a lot of companies who are going to be, who are going to need women on board. So, mm -hmm. yeah. what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions about angel investing? Uh, um, I think, well, the biggest one I think is this whole lifestyle business versus investable, like kind of an investable type of business that angels would typically invest in, or VCs would invest in. So I mean, I, people reach out to me a lot constantly, you know, hey, I'm opening up a store or, and it's just not the type of, you know, I mean, nothing's wrong with that, that's great, but that's not the type of thing that I invest in. So I think a lot of people, you know, they say, oh, I have an idea or and I want to fund my idea and they just will reach out to angel investors not realizing, A, like, that's not probably not an investable type of business that an angel would invest in. So that's like, the, I think that's the biggest misconception of like what we invest in and is your company like investable? Yeah. What's the criteria that you look at when you're evaluating whether you want to invest in a company specifically? So the main three things, there's a couple things, but you know, again, back to what I said earlier, like what problem are you addressing? Is it a big enough problem? Um, and then what's your solution? Is it a compelling solution? Are people gonna buy this? Um, it's really compelling. And then what we really look at and I look at is um, the founders, you know, so do they have domain expertise? So um, say it's a, you know, um, I don't know, it's like a, a legal tech, legal tech solution or something, you know, have they worked at a law firm? Are they a lawyer? They don't necessarily have to be a law, lawyer, but do they know this industry? Do they have the domain expertise? Um, you know, who are, who are on the board? Who are their advisors? You know, do they have what it takes, the resiliency? It's because being an entrepreneur is really, really difficult. Um, do I think that they have what it takes to, you know, execute and make this happen? Are they coachable? So, you know, I don't want to invest in someone who's a know-it-all. You know, I want someone to be able to know what they know, do, you know, and raise their hand and say, hey, I don't know this, and then I'm going to find um, a solution and, you know, or not, you know, have such an ego that I know everything and I'm not going to ask for help. You know, um, it's just horrible, like, when you have a company you've invested in and they're going down a road. You get, we get quarterly updates, but then, you know, they're having an issue, but if they have raised their hand and said, hey, you know, we need help, this is not going well, you know, we as investors could help them. Um, but if they kind of keep it to themselves and aren't coachable and, you know, that, that's a problem. So those are the kind of the criteria for sure. And then also, is it a big enough market, addressable market? So. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about KPIs in terms of your model of business and also if you're about to invest in a firm? In terms of? So KPIs before I invest or after I invest? Oh. Yeah, so I mean before I invest, 
the KPIs, I mean, it, so first thing is I don't ever invest in a company that is, is not already like established, um, selling a product, have customers. So that's like the number one thing. Do they have customers? Um, you don't, I mean, most of the companies are not profitable at that point, uh, but they have customers um, looking at their pipeline. Um, so that's a KPI. So, you know, say it's a B2B um, company, they may have one or two clients, but they have this pipeline of X amount of clients. So that X amount of clients, maybe, you know, 10% will convert. So I see that they have a robust pipeline. So that's really important. Um, so that's like the main thing. Um, and then, you know, pre investing how are you going to, so if you get this, close this round, you know, how are you, what are you going to use it? Like, how are you going to uh, deploy this capital? So they need to have a plan for that. Um, then after the investment, usually, um, um, usually as an investor, if you want to retain kind of what they call your pro rata share, you have to invest again um, in the next round, typically. Um, and so I look at, like, what's the growth been? Um, you know, if they, like, when I looked at them, did they have these clients, these, this pipeline, did they convert them? How many have they converted? What's been the growth? Um, so those are, like, the things that I look at if I'm going to do follow-on um, investing in, you know, and I've done that with a number of my companies, a couple of companies I have not because I felt like they weren't, they didn't grow as much as they should have. And I didn't want to, you know, throw good money after bad in a way. But I've been fortunate, like, um, only like, let's see, two companies have, um, you know, ceased operations out of, um, so through the funds. So I've invested in about 26 companies, so two. All the other ones are still around, which is good. So financials, you know, it's hard with early stage companies. A lot of them are projections. So we look at like currently what, you know, what are their financials now in terms of, you know, right now income and revenue they're making. Um, and then they have projections, you know, kind of do a deep dive. Like why are you, what's the numbers, what are, what's behind those numbers? And, you know, a lot of times people make assumptions. And so, you know, it may be, well, I'm going to onboard. I have this company, um, you know, I have a letter of intent. So we're going to, you know, they're going to acquire my software. And so if we have it up and running, we're going to have this kind of revenue in 2020. So trying to, like, you know, peeling the onion, getting behind those numbers and seeing that that's realistic. So the thing is a lot of early stage companies have projections, but some people will have projections that are just, you just know are just not going to happen. And they're not, I mean, they want it to look good, but then you drill down and you ask them, like, why do you have, like, how are you getting to this number? And so you're just, you know, once you do that and you're saying, you know, I don't think it's realistic that you're going to, you have a pipeline of 10 potential clients that you're going to convert all of them. That's like not realistic, maybe one or two, and let's change the numbers. So definitely um, that. But again, it's, you know, a lot of it is in early stage just <coughs> making assumptions and because um, they don't have that long track record. And in terms of references, um, yeah, those are really important. Um, <laughs> I have a funny story. Um, there was a company that a group of us were looking at investing, and I just did a quick Google search, and it was like this person had a like had a record, like an arrest record, um, and so like that doesn't necessarily disqualify you, but you know, I mean, it says a lot, like in terms of you know, you gotta have like dig into that. So definitely, personal references could be uh, customers for sure. Because um, you want to see like how they're dealing with their customers, are the customers satisfied? Are they going to be recurring customers? Um, and then people that they personal references, particularly people they've worked with before um, when they worked, um, those are really important. So we do do that. Um, we actually have like you know um, part of, like so I'm in you know investment team. We have someone who is a former journalist um, on ABC. She was on you know um, an anchor and you know did an investigative journalism. So she interviews the people. So she has like, she's really good. So she'll do the references um, because she's just really good at that. So, you know, a lot of it is like, you know, when we're investing, who has like a skill set in a particular area, they're going to do that part of the due diligence. And, you know, so she'll do the reference checks and that kind of thing and kind of get behind things and she'll research and um, which is good. Yeah. 
Are there any key questions that you found to be the most telling about entrepreneurs? Uh, I mean, I think a lot of it is, um, well, yeah, I mean, part of it, like, kind of the resiliency and, you know, um, we'll ask them, like, what was the most difficult thing they've ch had, challenged they had in life and how they overcome it. And that's really telling. Um, I've actually asked people, are you tired? And I know that sounds silly, but particularly if they've been at it for a while, um, because it's like, it's a marathon. And some people are like, yeah, I'm tired. And it's like, wow, just that's really revealing because I don't know if you're going to have enough stamina and gas to continue with this. Um, so those are the type of questions. What's your take on the seed investment landscape? I see like two competing narratives <coughs> where there are all these entrepreneurs who can't get any investment and then recent college graduates who will raise like 700000 plus on just an idea, and I want like a realistic depiction of like what's going on as a first-time entrepreneur trying to raise capital. So are those college students, like what do they look like? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, yeah, that happens. Um, re I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, there are people, they're getting raising money, early stage, seed, you know, um, yeah, absolutely, that's happening. You know, my, I look at women and I look at diverse entrepreneurs, that's not happening. Um, you know, they have to have a track record, they have to have revenue. Um, you know, that's still like just still, still an issue. Um, you know, I, it's gonna, I don't know what's going to happen now. I think the WeWork, people are kind of opening their eyes, particularly also the recent IPOs with Uber and Lyft um, not performing well. Um, I think it's really, I think it's shaking, shaking things up because you know, everyone's like, oh, these are going to be big IPOs, and WeWork didn't even make it, you know, in their valuation, and, like, they pulled their IPO. So I don't know. I think it'll be interesting to see what's going to happen. Uh, but, yeah, no, I mean, there's absolutely people who have an idea, and they get funding, um, at, you know, at, with an idea. Um, but, like, again, I'm focused on women and diverse entrepreneurs, and that's, that's not the reality. So. What's your ultimate end goal in investing? Yeah. So, I mean, I think obviously, I mean, very few companies make it to IPO. I mean, you know, that'd be great. Absolutely. Um, so, put an acquisition. So, um, Portfolio, we launched in 2016. We have had two exits since we launched, which is remarkable. Um, and so, the first exit we had was um, at 2x. So, we got two times, you know, I mean, we wanted more, but it is what it is. We got a return, 2x, which is great. And then we had an exit this summer. <coughs> And that was a 5x, so that was pretty good. You know, I mean, yes, we want like a, te I mean, people, most VCs measure, I mean, you want like 100x or 1,000x, but um, for us, like, I mean, I think we're getting a return if we can continue getting that return and then, um, you know, getting people to continue investing by showing that we have returns. I mean, really, our, our thesis is we want to get um, at least 100,000 women investing in at least one of our funds every year. And if we were to do that, you know, at a, you know, you can get to a fund for a minimum of ten thousand. Most people invest a lot more than that. But if we just got the minimum, that would be about one point six billion dollars of capital we could deploy every year. So it's really, um, so it's yeah, to get returns, but also to fund the type of companies you want to see in the marketplace. So I'll give an example. You know, um, and this is also like why Trish came up with Portfolia. So there's this woman. Um, who had um, a, a, a new breast, a breast pump. And so <laughs> breast pumps have been around for a long time. No one's had put technology on it. She created this, like, you know, you know, a tech play with the breast pump and made it advance. And she actually had angels who were women, and they funded it. She needs to scale, so she needs to get VC. She needs to raise, she wanted to raise, like, 2.5 million or something. And so she, um, you know, went to Sand Hill Road, was, you know, pounding the pavement, like, no one would give her money. But she actually had a product, she had customers, she had a track record. And so Trish, so she's like, I, I don't understand. So Trish called up one of the VCs who came through Kaufman, her program, she knew. And he said, you know, great idea, but he's like, you know what, like, in my Monday morning meeting, so most VCs have Monday morning meetings where they review all their portfolio companies. He's like, I just, it's the ick. And she's like, what do you mean, ick? He's like the ick factor. Like, I don't want to talk about breasts and breast pumps at my Monday morning meeting. And so, yeah, so ridiculous, right? So here is this woman who has a product where there's a huge market for it. And because this 
white male is uncomfortable with it, she's not getting funding. And so Trish said, you know what, this is ridiculous. So we're going to invest in companies we want to see in the world. And so that's our end game is like not only, yes, we want to return, absolutely, of course, we need to have return to continue. But we want to also fund companies that need to be out in the marketplace that we want to see in the marketplace. So that's, you know, that's what we're trying to do. And we want to change things. And so if we can get 100,000 women every year, that's going to be $1.6 billion that's going to flow that we can invest in companies. And that's, why, that's how we're going to change things. So not the typical, you know, people, VCs need to change, but it's like we have to drag them to change. So instead, we're saying, you know, we're going to assemble. And women, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but right now, women control 51% of the wealth in this country. It's going to grow even more. And so there's women who are, who are, who are, you know, who are affluent, but yet they don't, less than 1% invest in angel investing, early stage investing. So we want to bring more women to do that. And by doing that, we'll invest in companies that we want to see. And women are the biggest consumers of products and, and make the investment um, you know, buying decisions. So, but we're not using our capital, deploying our capital to help companies in that way. So that's kind of our end game, and to make returns and invest in great companies that are going to generate returns. So maybe we have time for one more question. Um, what do you do for like networking, um, whether it's you know uh, angel VC contacts or like your pipeline? So I'm a I'm a member of a couple of groups. Um, one is called the List. It's actually kind of a virtual group. So it's a listserv. Um, this woman, Rachel Sklar. Um, and Glennis McNeil started it, um, and they have some pretty prominent people, like Shonda Rhimes is a part of it, like some pretty prominent um, women. And so it's only for women, and you have to apply. So I got in about a year and a half ago, and so it's great. Like we just email, like, hey, I'm, you know, raising money or I'm starting a fund. Like, who can you connect me to? And people are very, very uh, helpful. So she did it to um, initially just kind of put together women in tech, but it's grown, you know, people in media and like all these different people. Um, so that's been really impactful. We do offline events, so like you know, um, hey, I'm in Boston. Like wh wh we call it sister uh, sister listers. Like who's who sister listers who in Boston? Like you want to get together, and have breakfast, and people get together, and have breakfast, or have dinner. So it's like kind of network, and, and so I'm part of that. Um, and then you know, there's another kind of lister called Stealth Mode. Um, <laughs> Richard Kirby is a VC, African American VC, um, and I don't know how many people on that list, but it's it's a big lister. And they do offline events as well, but it's more of like, hey, you know, my company needs a product manager, or here's this job listing, or here's this, you know, whatever. It's like it's about information flow. So these listservs, and then you know, I'm a member of like other kind of in-person um, organizations, so Pipeline Angels. We're, you know, I'm an alumni of that. We have 400, you know, members. So I'm part of that portfolio. You know, our it's actually not only investing in a fund, but it's like we built a community. Um, so we have about 2,000 people who've made an investment in at least one of our funds. So we have a community of people as well. So those are different things that I do. And I'm about involved in um, Brown in New York, um, the Brown Club in New York. And they have events and just kind of networking. So I wanted to say thank you so much to Laureen. I know some of you have to leave, but I wanted to say thank you. So thank you. I know some of you have to leave, but if you have time to stick around, um, maybe post some more questions. You're welcome to do that. We have the room for a little bit longer. Thank you to everyone, and thank you again to Lorraine for thank sharing you, your everyone. wisdom. Thank you.